Welcome everyone to our first Craftsy Chat. I'm Colette Christian and I have the wonderful Mr. Domestic with me and we are going to talk all things quilting, crafting and sewing. But first, I want to just update you on how these Craftsy Live Chats are going to work. Every month, we're going to go live for an hour with one of your favorite Craftsy instructors. Today, I've got Mr. Domestic with me, but next month, it could be me talking all things baking and pastry or another one of our incredibly talented instructors. We're using Craftsy, our Craftsy chats, our, the purpose is to build our Craftsy community and give you a chance to interact with your favorite instructors. So now that we have that out of the way, Mr. Domestic, are you ready for some questions? I am so ready. I am so stoked and honored that like I'm the inaugural Craftsy Chat. Like, thank you for having me right on. Um, most of y'all know what I'm about. Really excited to like chat with you because um, these are my favorite things to talk about. So yeah, let's do it. I'm stoked. Well, Mr. Domestic, I was so thrilled that you are our first guest because I'm just a quick confession. Sometimes when I'm sewing, I just put you on in the background. So I feel like I have just the most wonderful company in the world. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. That's an honor. Like when I started YouTube, I never knew what it would be like. Um, and like that of all things, like that's so cool. Cause that was my intent was to like, make it feel like you're in my sewing room, hanging out with me. Um, well, and so thank you for that. That means a lot. You nailed it. Thank so you. Let's go to our first question. Okay. Renee asks, what inspires Mr. Domestic in the quilt? What inspires you in the quilt projects that you create? And who was it that asked? Renee asked. Hi, Renee. How are you doing? What inspires me really is like everything. It's living. And I know that's like silly, but um, I don't just draw my inspiration from quilts. Uh, I mean, the social media is amazing. It's it's impossible not to be inspired by the community of quilters and makers online, but it could be there's, I want a next level of skill. So it's like, there's something that is a stretch project for me. I've never done it before. I don't know if I can acquire the skill. And then once I put that online that I'm doing it, I kind of have to make it happen. So y'all hold me accountable and make me next level my, my skills and stuff. So that's a big one. It's like, what do I want to learn? Um, what do I think is hard? Um, what maker or designer do I want to elevate? I do that a lot instead of using my own patterns. It's like there's someone, if I find a, a creative that like mirrors my own personal and business values that I want to help like lift up, then I'll buy their pattern and make it. Um, and then my daughter, I have a seven and a half year old. Her half birthday is on November 9th. So we're celebrating it this year because it's May 9th normally. But that's what started all of this was her. She's seven. She was a catalyst for me starting to sew. She's my inspiration and everything has been a part of every project. Even in my fabric design, because I design fabric, she comes and helps me. Like when I'm stuck, I have her come into my room and I'm like, hey, can you help me? What's a better color? And she'll tell me. Mm. She'll tell me when I don't want to know it, but she'll always tell me. And so um, she, she inspired me the rest of the way. That's marvelous. I absolutely love that you celebrate her her full birthday and her half birthday. Sounds like you have a great creative, you have a great creative assistant. I so, sure do. And she lets everyone know she's my number one assistant and she's to be referred to as Little Miss Domestic. <laughs> I love it. Our second question, speaking of technique, comes from Cassis and she's asking, what got you interested in EPP or English paper piecing. Okay, and who was that? That was Cassis. Cassis, hi! What got me interested in English paper piecing? Okay, so I'm gonna divulge. Some people may have heard this story, but whenever I first started in the world of social media and started to build like the brand of Mr. Domestic, whatever that is, I started thinking about finding creatives that I wanted to like see what I was doing because maybe we could collaborate. And one of the things that I would do was buy a pattern from like a designer 
or um, maker that like I had a, an IG crush on, you know, those platonic, like I'm in love with their stuff kind of things. So that person was Liz Elliott. Hey, Liz, what's up? And I bought her Wicked Hexy pattern because I was exclusive to Art Gallery Fabrics because I only use their fabric for the most part. So I couldn't use that. And I just love what she stood for. So I bought this Wicked Hexy pattern. The only one that I could do, it was English paper piecing. Never done it before. Did it. Um, it was amazing. And then I fell in love. And then from there, Pat Bravo, the creative director, one of my good friends at Art Gallery Fabrics, she asked if I wanted to host an EPP party with her because she saw that I was having a lot of fun online and she wanted to join it. So we did this 12 block half year English paper piecing party where essentially in that time frame I became an expert and um, it was really cool. It was one of the first like big community events that I did online where it was a lot of people participating and it's like it's weird, not weird, but it's kind of awesome, like a like a cohort in school or something. I remember everyone who did that with me because that was pretty early on, and we still have a relationship, and it's just really cool what we can do online. That's marvelous. Our next question is about what to do with an antique quilt, and so listen to this. So a guest is asking, I have an antique patchwork quilt that I want to make into a wall hanging and pillows for my brothers. So any suggestions? It's an antique quilt. It's an antique quilt. And so this is a finished quilt that you want to turn into a keepsake for your brothers. Is this, this what I'm hearing? That's what it sounds like. Okay. Um, my first thing is good luck, but <laughs> honestly, before, cause this is not my wheelhouse, mm. um, but I have met, people who do quilt restoration or focus on antique quilts. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just jump in me. I would, I would just cut something up and make it cute. But like really to, um, to honor the history of whatever it is, I would at least like reach out to some restoration um, quilter. If you want to like DM me, feel free to, and I can hook you up. I'll ask people in my Facebook group. Like if they can find someone or put it in the comments, y'all, if y'all do that, put it in the comments. What's up? What's up? Say hi. Like that. Um, but that's what I, I wouldn't, I would not jump in to it, but I'm going to assume that there's going to be some meticulous picking apart to turn it into multiple things. I, I, I would want to keep the integrity of whatever it was and not change the look of it, but I haven't seen this. Like, I don't know what it looks like. So um, just do whatever brings you joy at the end of the day. That's my answer for everything. Is it going to bring you joy? And if so, do it. And if you're scared, don't do it. Call someone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Call someone. I think that's very wise advice. So next, um, a guest is asking, what are your favorite quilting motifs? And then, and what considerations when selecting a quilt motif what are your considerations when selecting a quilt motif? I want to say that a little. Um, I will learn to speak eventually. And You're then, doing great. You sound amazing. And thank you in advance. Now I know before you answer that you have a, a blockbuster motif right under your elbows. Oh, this? My Lone Star? Yeah. I have that? That. Really? Yeah, I mean... Whatever. So it, I'm hearing that we're talking about piecing or quilting because they're two separate, separate things. So piecing, I love quick and easy. See, this is this is my Lone Star. I'm doing this for a charity um, for LGBTQ kids in Wisconsin. It's for um, an organization that I love. So really, I love these. Why I love this, and this is just for piecing. I'm all about. Let me tell you this rule. You might have heard it in one of my classes, but I'm a 95 percenter by trade. I'm just a 95 percenter. What does that mean? I'm a process person. I want the process of anything that I do to be filled with joy because that's one thing about a handmade item, right? It traps all of the emotions of the journey of you creating it. So if I'm like not liking it and I give it to someone, I don't want to give people that bad juju. So I do everything I can to make my process joyful. How I do that is I strive for 95% perfection. I don't strive for 100%er. I'm not 100%er. I feel that that, that final 5% steals your joy, potentially, if you fixate it. Like if you're so fixated on that one flaw and you don't see like 
the rest of the amazingness, you're never going to be able to find joy in it. So I just leave those design choices in. They're there. I find my joy. And so that is why I love this one is that I have a quick and easy video on it where it's like, I don't even try to match up all the points. Like if y'all want to try and click my like or clock my Y seams, go for it. But you can't tell. It looks good. It looks good. It looks good. So yeah, I'm all about that 10 feet away rule. And so that's with piecing. Quilting, I'm a straight line quilter. I love and, and am obsessed with people who have the skill of long arm or free motion quilt. I don't have those yet. So I just stick to um, straight line. One, because it, it makes sense to me aesthetically. And two, it's one of those like um, meditative process things that you can just do. I come in my room. I get my machine ready. I turn on some Enya and rock out to her. Yeah. And then I do some straight line quilting with some like chamomile tea for an hour. And whatever I'm dealing with, I feel amazing. So yeah, once again, I'm all about the process. Other kind of quilting, I'm one of those, um, I like to quilt my check people. So I'll happily send it to someone that has the skill for it. So those are my favorite motifs. Thank you, Mr. Domestic. First. Kathy has a question, a great question. Kathy asks, do you have trouble staying on task with all of your projects? Well, um, I mean, it's hard, right? Like we all have our work in progresses and no exaggeration, I probably have 50 because I made the mistake of falling in love with yarn and play too. So now I crochet and like knit and I do fabric weaving. So it's like, um, no, that's never, that's never a trouble with me because what I do, and I think this is why my productivity is so high since I do different things. Like if I get bored with this then I'll just go to something else and I'm always working on something. So it's like my productivity is never, is never hard right now. It's kind of hard because I'm really enjoying that couch and Netflix being at home. But, um, I come in here and I, and I, I, it's, just turn on your phone and go to something positive. Like if you go to the Mr. Domestic community anywhere you're going to be inspired to be productive. And that's one of the beautiful things about the internet is that connectivity we all have here that um, it's really, it's really easy to be lifted up. If you, if you find the right crowd and stick with me, kids, I'm the right crowd. <laughs> it sounds good. All right. <laughs> this next one, Mr. Domestic, Nancy is asking, she says, I have dozens of antique Dresden flower appliques that have never been made into blocks. The fabric is quite frail and it appears that they've been washed. What can she do with these? Mm, there's so many questions I have. I know. Um, it really depends on the age and the quality of the fabric. So without seeing, it's hard to give guidance. But to me, a positive in this is that it's already been washed. So you know what's going to happen once it's mm. once it's been washed. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the after effect. And that's when a lot of the damage could occur for the more frail, fragile. Um, for me, if I had those, I would want to put them on some some fabric right away. And I, I know it's antique, but I would probably get some like stitch witchery or some kind of fusible and fuse it on some some fabric. I know y'all going to disagree. Some of y'all, if y'all got different advice, put in the comments. That's what they're there for. But um, that's what I would do with it because it's like, it's already pre-made there for you. Just slap it on some fabric and call it a day and be like, look, I made an antique quilt and people will be happy. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. That sounds great. And then we have another guest asking, and I, this is actually something I was wondering too, and she says, you are awesome, which you are. And the question is, what are your favorite online resources for unique fabrics? Hmm. Online resources for unique fabrics. So first, um, any shop that carries any of the Mr. Domestic fabrics, that's a good one. <laughs> um, but interesting it depends on what kind of sewing you use i'm going to say we're going to stick with quilting um there are some shops that i know carry like everything like hawthorne thread fat quarter shop both of them align with my my business and personal values so those are some big for quilting fabrics but for outside of that 
there's still mood fabrics in New York City. They have so much. And then there's a new fabric shop. I want everyone to go look it up. It's um, Melanated Fabrics. And it's um, Brittany and Mimi G. I know Faith is there and there's one more. But it's um, a quartet of people that uh, created an online fabric shop for POC to get a fabric that would align with with um, with what they're wanting, which is different what, than the typical lens that fabric shops look for. So if people are on the look for that, please check out Melanated Fabrics. I was so proud of them when they came up with that idea. And now that it's out, I'm definitely going to be doing a lot of shopping there. And the fabric is gorgeous. That's, that's an awesome suggestion. Next, and this was the last video of, of yours that I watched, was, was your Scandinavian folded star. Yes. Paula is asking, she says, I'm getting ready to try your Scandinavian folded star. Any tips on making it? Um, just jump right in. Don't be, don't be fearful. Um, I have that the video and it's, it's a lot simpler than you think, but one tip is make sure that the fabric is stiff. Like mm -hmm. don't, don't let it be untreated. It needs to be, um, like I, I love this thing called Terial Magic. It's a fabric stabilizer and it's all natural and it makes fabric like a paper-like consistency. I love that stuff. Or like a fusible interfacing, put that on there because that will make a durable, long-lasting ornament. If you just use fabric without any stabilizer, then um, it wouldn't last over time because it would just have the, like the durability of natural fabric and it's not meant to like stay in a folded state. So that would be my suggestion for it. Thank you. And Mr. Domestic, I'm going to piggyback because your response generated a question for me. And okay. maybe if I'm thinking it, then maybe our viewers are thinking it. Okay. What fusible interfacing do you recommend? Because there's so many out there. Oh, yeah. I'm a pill on SF 101 guy. Okay. Like, that's what I like. Um, I like woven um, because it has more drape than the non woven. So that's what I'm really into. And SF-101 is like a mid-weight interfacing. I buy that by the, by the bolts when it's on sale because you can use that on anything. Like if you want to make a t-shirt quilt, you can use it on that. Any of the crafts that I make, you can use it on that. You can use it on clothing. My fabric weaving, we'll use it as the base. So that's, that's my favorite interfacing is SF-101. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. All right. So now, oh, I just want to make a comment. We have... Um, uh, our viewers are recommending Cindy Needham's blog for oh, antique quilt, quilt restoration. So I'm just going to give that shout out because we've had two questions about antique quilt pieces and antique quilts. So so uh, there's that. <laughs> the next question, Ruth is asking, what size template do you use? when making your hex rainbow mask i use i'm i'm listening i forgot to plug my 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 camera source in and it's about to die so we don't want that to happen so hello everyone <laughs> <laughs> so the hex size that i used for the rainbow one was a three quarter inch hexagon and those measurements are the measurement of the side of the hexagon i'm not interested in going any smaller than that that uh, that doesn't sound enjoyable. My my go to is one inch. So I made another one with one of my fabric collections. Oh, it's in the wash. And I did one with um, one inch hexagons. So there's two versions you can find online. If you go to my my website, you'll find both of them. But the rainbow one was um, three quarter inches. I love that one. Thank you. Of course. And next question. And I hope, forgive me if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Sharan asks, do you use a walking foot for your Lone Star quilt? Absolutely. Yeah, I love walking foot quilting. Um, I just have a new machine that I have yet to be named. I'm still waiting for the right name because I name all of my machines because then I feel like my relationship with them improves. It's kind of like a next level situation. So I haven't named that one yet, but um, there's like an AccuFeed walking foot on it. It's a Janome. Whoa, it's glorious. But yeah, I love, that's what I did for this. Don't look too close because that machine goes 1400 stitches per minute. And I was like, I'm going to do that with this. So it's a little special if you look too close, but um, yeah, walking foot quilting is the quilting that I love to do when I'm jamming to Enya. 
<laughs> that sounds amazing. I'm I am glad someone else names their sewing machine <laughs> than I do, and I I don't feel so unusual. So that's awesome. What's the name of yours? Tell us. Tell us. Um, my uh, cappuccino is my Bernina Fashionista, okay. and then I have a Faf One Thirty, and her name is Belinda. Okay. Hi. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't feel so. That's awesome. Okay. Now we have um, Samantha is asking, and it's 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 kind of a long question. So Samantha says she's got a puff piece quilt row that she's been given to sew together, but it's made out of a ton of different types of fabric from three generations of the family. Any ideas on how to deal with the variability of how stretchy the material is? She says she's done two rows with a zigzag and she's been putting this off for over a year. Suggestions. Mm. So there's a couple suggestions there. These are all great questions, y'all. I wish that like I could see your stuff, but I'm just gonna visualize. I'm gonna pretend. Um, so if you're not wanting to take it apart and like interface the fabrics, mm -hmm. that's the only way you could get the fabrics to feel the same when you're sewing them. They'll have the same as a similar amount of stretch. Um, one thing you could do. You might like put some plastic underneath or above, so maybe on top so that one just glides through or use a Teflon foot to like let it get through um, because it, it won't, won't have any drag on the top. So everything would move how the bottom is moving. That's one way. You could also use a liquid stabilizer to stabilize them so that they'll work. Um, but that's all like before, after zigzags where it's at. That's all. That's all you can really do and maybe reduce the tension a little bit to see if that will um, impact it at all. It depends. This is a, it depends where the puckering is will determine where you want the tension to be. And you might need to change it in between blocks. I know it's like, this is a very high maintenance next level kind of project. I get it. But um, I think that would, that would just doing it one at a time, seeing what you need to adjust. And once again, I'm always accessible. Feel free to reach out. You can contact me via my website, DM me somewhere. Um, I'd love to help you further with this. Thank you. Of course. Our next question comes from Carla. Carla is asking, I may be mistaken, but I think you said you were gonna take Holly Ann Knight's FMQ Academy course. Academy course, and she says, did you end up taking the course? I wish that I would have. I loved that course. Unfortunately, I had to pull out last minute because I had some personal stuff that I um, I was having to process. Um, I was going through a rough patch personally, and I didn't, I didn't feel like I could be my best self for it. So um, I wanted to make sure that I could really be there the next time. But I've heard rave reviews from it. Like, she is an FMQ, like, resource super stoked at what she's built because all of the students love it. So no, I still don't have the skills. <laughs> but it sounds like it's still on your list. Oh sure. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Our next question is from, and I want to say this correctly, Casa. She's asking, do you have a favorite, favorite color palette? And do you ever struggle to get away from color arrangements that you gravitate towards? And if so, how do you overcome that? Gotcha. Um, absolutely. My color palette is blue across the board. I've always been a blue guy. Like um, these are the fabrics that I've, I've designed. You really can't see them, but I have an entire stack devoted to just blues. If I could work with blues all day long and maybe throw in a mustard and a turquoise and a navy, like, Oh, I would. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, and then I do rainbows. That's the opposite. I go on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, and that's one way I can get out of it. One thing that I do is I like to find projects where I have to use the least amount of brain power as possible. 
where I can just be present and it's not about thinking or stressing. It's just about doing yeah. um, that improvisational piecing helps me with that. It just helps me get outside of my head to where I don't stress out about it. And then fabric weaving. Those of you who have followed me a while know about my fabric weaving. Like I have a whole wall dedicated to it. Like here's an orange one that I did like here. I've done some where I've done, I think I, the one that I have the most is 21 different colors in a weave. And this with the wefting needle, it takes me like, it takes me an hour because I'm like an expert or whatever. But um, the first time I used it, it took a hundred hour process down to two hours. And why I say that is had I not done fabric weaving first, I never would have become a quilter because I was intimidated by the number of combinations of fabrics that needed to be in one piece. Like I came from before this, I came from like a fashion background. I understood clothes and I, I sewed apparel in the beginning and um, I knew how to put like two or three fabrics together, but 20, like, come on, that's a lot. So fabric weaving, I could pick some fabrics and this was back when I was uncomfortable and didn't trust my intuition. I would weave them. And if there was one that just didn't feel right, I would yank it out and put in something different. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't mess up the integrity of the weave. But really, me doing that in this 16 by 16 inch square, I was able to translate that into like 80 by 80 quilts because I felt more comfortable through this with like color play. And then don't be scared. And then ask a kid. If you've got a kid in your life, be like, hey, what color would go good with that? And do it. And do it. That's what I did with Helena in the very beginning was she was a baby. That's how they all start. We all start out as babies. <laughs> we would go to this huge fabric store and she would touch fabrics. And even if I thought it was gross, I'd pick it up and it'd be my job to put it together and make it cute. Um, and she was always right. Like the, the, the intuition of a kid is, is so pure. So I would just say, trust them and do what they say. And then don't fight it. And then fall in love with something new. That's what I would say do. Awesome. Great. Well, we have more information on those Dresden flowers. The fabrics, Nancy, this is from Nancy. The fabrics are from the teens and 20s. And she was thinking maybe reverse applique. Her reasoning is that some of these fabrics were cut off bias and they're not as circular as maybe they could be. Wow. A reverse applique would be fly. That would look super cute. And then like the aesthetic of a reverse applique, depending on whether you did raw edge or not, could. Um, tie in everything. Like it could tie in whatever that fabric looked like to give it more of a rustic feel to where it would be really, really cool. This is exciting. I want to see you make this. So please keep me posted on it. It sounds great. Sounds beautiful. Right? Yeah, totally. Have to definitely share that when it's done. And next is a question about timing from Sangeeta. She's asking, how do you split your time showing, sewing versus crochet and which activity do you spend more time on? Uh, and who is the name of this? This is Sangeeta. Hey, Sangeeta. Um, I mean, I just do what I want, really. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is the real of it. What determines what I'm going to do is what's on Netflix. So if it's a show that I want to like just veg out and binge, if I'm having one of those days, I know I can grab a, a, a skein of yarn and a crochet hook and I could sit down and go to town, like no more preparation. But then I can do the same with English paper piecing too. So um, I have started doing more of that and I, I kind of forgot that that brought me the same kind of joy. But really it, what drives it is one, if I have a deadline, then I have to do what the deadline tells me to do. And then I like to have a variety. I found myself, and I've always been this way, that I have a higher output of productivity when I'm doing everything. So if I have one weaving project, I always like to have one weaving project, one crochet project, one traditional sewing project, one smaller EPP project, one of everything so I can just dabble. And I just go with the wind. This whole journey of Mr. Domestic has been this five, six year serendipitous run where look at me, I'm the inaugural craft teacher. Like that's so cool. Um, yeah, just, I let, I let my intuition guide me. I'm very like, 
I'm very touchy feely. Um, so whatever, like I'll look at this. Is this going to be fun? No. Then I'll pick up some yarn and then I get all like tingly. So it's the tingles really. Awesome. <laughs> we have another question and this is from a Woodhouse fan. So I think PG Woodhouse is asking, she, um, I am an experienced sewer, but have only made garments thus far. What would you suggest is a first, a good first project for quilting? Um, really just, uh, I mean, maybe a four patch mm -hmm. or like just cut up some squares. I even have a tutorial on sewing squares. I would just do like four or five inch squares, maybe like a baby quilt or something and just, um, so that and why i'm saying this it's not for your ability because i can tell you right now if you have the skills to sew apparel and you've been doing it more than a couple days um you do have it and it's just the confidence it's, and it's the same thing with people who want to go from quilting to apparel you already have the skill set it's just different language so um really just jump in don't be scared why i'm saying doing the easiest thing possible is because then you'll have the confidence to tackle harder things and you'll be able to say yeah i do have the skills for this it's just a little different um so that would be it or you can just go to town and like do something super hard this one also is a really good one to start with it looks like it's complicated and it's not um i have an easy version on my youtube but something simple something simple maybe find a bundle of, of fabric that you really love. Um, and then you just use that. There are a lot of fat quarter patterns out there, which um, for those that are new to quilting, we talk about fat quarters. Um, that they're, they're short and skinny. It's usually like 18 inches by 22 inches as opposed to with the fabric. That's how it is there. So that's the measurement that quilters love. And there's a lot of patterns like that. You could even sew up a bundle of fat quarters and call it a day. Um, but really, I just want you to, to get into a project where you can go from start to finish. Ooh, a mini quilt might be awesome too. People love the minis. I don't personally, I turn them into pillows, but people are all about like making like 20 inch something and then putting like a little border on it and putting it on a wall for art. That's another option. Um, there's a lot of options, but come play with me and I'll help you out. Absolutely. Sounds great. Now, next, we have a question from Heather. Heather wants to learn fabric weaving. And she says, do you have any tips or resources you can share? And also, she says, it's a comment. She says she hasn't quilted in a while, but she's getting inspired right now, which is exactly oh, what we want. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so how would you get into fabric weaving? Yeah, I am one of two people on the interweb that you should go to. Um, and then my, my good friend, one of my favorite people on the universe, her name's Wefty or not, her name's Tara. And she, um, created the Wefty needle. Um, we created this beautiful friendship based on fabric weaving, weaving. And so I would, um, you can go to my, my shop. I've got patterns in the tool there. I have a playlist on my YouTube that has like 17, 18 videos going through like from soup to nuts, all of the steps and doing fabric weaving. So any specific step you had a question about, you could ask. Um, I'm always around if you had a question to be directed, like if you have no idea what I'm saying right now. Um, and then Tara, I would definitely, if you're interested in it, Tara's the, like, she's the OG. So she's the one that created the needle and invented it. So um, definitely check out Wefty Needle online. And it's W-E-F-T-Y Needle. And um, she's rad, she's super cool. Awesome. All right, now we have a guest asking, my first quilting project was a disappearing nine patch lap quilt. And it, she says it was fun, or he, it, I was fun to do something as easy as a nine patch, but exciting. So that's a good plug for a nine patch for a first project. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's I, great. I mean, that's great. Cause those, a nine patch, for those that don't know, there's like a four patch and a nine patch. And then there's like a disappearing where the patches disappear. Really, like if someone says four patch, it's four squares. One, two, three, four in a grid. Nine patch, it's nine squares. So three by three. And so because quilters are wacky and we like to sew stuff up and then cut it up again and sew it up again, then you'll take that and like slice it in a certain way and then sew it back up in a different order, and then it becomes like a disappearing nine patch or four patch. 
Um, it, once again, it's something that looks super elaborate um, if you're thinking that you sew each one together. But um, that's it's cool. It's cool to just do it, just to see what happens and all the different patterns you can come up with. Just with squares too, which is super cool. Yeah, that's it's really amazing. And and I think you'd agree, like when you're new to quilting, when you get that first quilt put together, it's the most thrilling. It's just, it's just, I I mean, my first quilt put me over the moon. I felt so accomplished. Yeah. So just pick a pattern, do it, love it, enjoy it, and have that satisfaction. And then it feels so it does it feels so good. It feels so good to make a quilt for real. It really does. It's it really does. We have more questions. So sorry, I got off uh, <laughs> got onto a tangent there, but I I really feel that so heart whole. And Jenna is asking. She's saying, uh, new to quilting here. What are some great tools and tips for me? She's headed to the store to get her basic supply set up. This feels like it's like a game show question. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the pressure's on. Do I know the answers? Um, you do. Brand new quilter. Um, you need a sewing machine, right? For the most part, um, thread. You'll need universal needles. Um, depending on your machine, it'll tell you what needles you need. Um, a quilting thread for quilting and for piecing, because sometimes they're different. Like me, I use a a 50 weight for piecing, and then I use like an 80 weight polyester for quilting. Mm. Um, but you, but to, if you're beginning, don't worry, this is probably too many words for you. Just get the one 50 or 40 weight. Um, then you need batting. Um, you'll need your fabric to make your quilt. Um, you'll need a way to baste it, to put the sandwich together. I prefer fusible batting or spray adhesive to a million safety pins, but some people swear by the safety pins. And I just did a um, like a mini video on my Instagram where I showed how to wall based. Like I do it on the on the wall now instead of doing it on the floor. <laughs> Game changer. But those are really the things you need. If you have a walking foot, that'll help with like binding and quilting if you wanted to do it. But it's not it's not crucial depending on how you based. Um, so those are really, I mean, that's the, the basics of quilting. You don't need a lot. Um, and then most importantly, you need a pattern of some sort if you want to follow it. Um, but there are so many online, you know, on, on Craftsy, on my, my website, my YouTube, there's lots. So those are the, those are the basic supplies. Don't forget the batting. But if you do, my very first quilt that I made, I cut up a fleece blanket because I forgot to buy batting. So I just oh. took one of my kids' fleece blankets and I just used that in the middle and then I sliced off the edges. She didn't know. She didn't and know. it worked fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It worked fine. It's a little heavier than batting, but um, yeah, make it work. Make it work. A make it work moment. That yeah. sounds great. Well, we have Evelyn is letting us know, and I think this is a more challenging pattern, but her first quilt was a sisterhood. And she's laughing. She's like, it was probably not the best place to start. But, but, but you, you know, if you got it done, and that's it, right? You did it. You and did then, it. Mr. Domestic, we have a really lovely comment. Mm -hmm. And a guest is letting us know that your enthusiasm is contagious. Mm -hmm. It makes, and makes me want to get going on my crafting right now. I've been in a no so zone since COVID became a reality. And uh, so let's give them some encouragement. So, yeah. Yay. You're, you're going to do it. Uh, like, honestly, um, I almost started crying, but I'm not ready to do that yet. But like, <laughs> really, thank you. Thank you. But one thing that I'll say to you is just do something. Like my most recent YouTube video is like, it takes three minutes to make a, a pumpkin out of like knit fabric or a, a shirt sleeve. Um, and like the joy that I get from seeing those three minute pumpkins around my house is insane. And and there's no way you don't have the stuff for it. Like even find a small, if, if you're in a no sew zone or like you don't have the tools or ability, there's something that you can be doing that's gonna bring you joy and you have stuff in your house right now to do it. So um, if you need some ideas, come and find me, I'll give them to you. But 
don't think you got to jump into something big because the amount of joy you can produce in a small project could last a couple days or a while. So um, that's my that's my advice is one, thank you. And then two, don't think big, just think small. There's something you can do right now. Baby steps. Yeah. Baby steps. Uh, Kristen is asking, well, she's saying, she says, I have a fabric showroom and have a ton of remnant fabrics in all types of content and weights, but she's just started learning to sew a couple of months ago and, in, and she is inspired to take up quilting. I understand cotton broadcloth is the best for quilting, but I'm wondering what are the limitations as far as fabrics go? And she says, based on her experience with selling fabrics, stretch is not preferable. Right. Broadcloth, that's a that's a baller kind of fabric. It's really awesome. It feels great. Doesn't necessarily mix well with wovens. For the most part, it's just a it's a traditional um, quilters cotton. Most of them are 100% cotton, and that's what like a lot of the the brands print on. Um, but even within them, there there's a variety mm. of, of quality. And even if it says they're 4.5 ounces, which is the standard weight for quilters cotton, it might have a little bit different density. Um, but if you have a you're saying you have a bunch of remnants. You can make it work. Um, yeah, stretchy fabric, like knit jersey, that's for clothes and apparel. I've made, but this could be a challenge to you, I've made whole cloth knit jersey fabrics, and I've used wool batting in the middle. And I used the right, the right type of, I have a tutorial on it, the right type of thread, and that's durable. You could yank it, and it doesn't pop out, and it's great. So you can, but I wouldn't mix it with wovens unless you had a really cute print and then just put on some interfacing. But mm -hmm. as long as, um, like, the, the density of the weave of the fabrics, regardless of how thin or thick it is, I think it will work well together if you put it in a quilt. It wouldn't matter to me. I think it might add some cool dimension to it to have different weight of fabric in it. It would just look cool and textural. So exactly. go for it. Yeah. A treasure trove of possibility. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Cool. People make quilts out of anything. Um, there was this beautiful award winning quilt by Melissa, Melissa Averinos. I don't know how to pronounce the last name, but it was beautiful. And she used um, some jeans from a brother that had passed away into a quilt beautiful mixed with quilters cotton and it was stunning um so the sky's the limit really with quilting it just depends on on what you want to do and um if you need affirmation for for doing it a little different right on let's teach some people some stuff and show them something new so go for it sounds good now we have a guest asking and i love this question how about some holiday gifts for friends and family would like and some suggestions? Suggestions for, for gifts, for friends and family, anything. <laughs> um, but like I love, like this time of year, I love making ornaments. I love little keepsakes. Um, I have a bajillion ornament tutorials on my YouTube. Um, anything small, a zipper pouch. I've got a good zipper pouch tutorial. Um, what else do I have? Let me see what I have. <laughs> like this would be cute. It's like I'm in my room, like something like this, a little bin. Like it's cute. Out of your favorite Mr. Domestic fabric. <laughs> and then like you can make like a little drawstring bag. Right? There's lots of things. Masks. Why not make a festive mask for everyone? That's what I would do if I was talking to my family. I would that would make everyone a mask. I'm kidding. They're wonderful people, I'm sure. Um <laughs> what else? You could weave something. If you do a fabric weaving, people will love this. Like this, it looks daunting. But if you did this and turned it into a pillow and sent it to someone, they would love it. Um, anything smaller. I mean, there's so many things. But pouches, people love pouches. I don't think you can have enough pouches. Um, pouches and masks. That's Mr. Domestic says pouches and masks, 2020. <laughs> I agree. You can never have enough. You can never have too many bags or pouches. Uh -huh. For sure. Now my floor, my floor would say something different to me about having too many, but like no. <laughs> well, you can put them inside each other. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. 
So then the floor can't complain. Okay. So our next question is, we're kind of back to quilts. Yeah. Sandra is asking, she says, I have a bunch of jelly roll type strips that are not straight cut. Can I just use them together and square it at the end? Do you have any other suggestions for me? And she says she's a recent newbie. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm a no rules kind of person. So um, that wouldn't bother me if they weren't cut straight um, or if they weren't all cut on grain, if there was variety there. I will just suggest to you to um, pin or clip the strips together before you sew. Because if you don't, and one of them is on the bias, and on the bias means it's diagonal, so it's a little stretchy when you pull it, then that might create some wibble wobbles in there. So if you clip or pin it before you sew it, you're good to go. But yeah, it, it shouldn't create a problem. I don't think, as long as you're meticulous in that step. And generally, I'm not meticulous, but that's the step you would need to be in order for it not to be um, wibbly wobbly. But then honestly, and this is my tip for all quilters, at the end of the day, and iron can fix a lot of mistakes. Mm. Like, iron it, like, get that out there. I use a lot of, like, my elbow grease to, like, get the wibbly wobblies gone. And once you quilt it, you won't see it. So um, even if there is a little bit, don't sweat it. It's going to be great. If, it, if, if it's off whenever you put it together and put the batting on, then you iron it. If it's still off, you can quilt it. If it's still a little bit off, you wash it and dry it and it comes out and it's all crinkly and you can't see anything. So um, don't worry about it. You got it. Well, that's good advice and good news and lots of ways to, lots of ways to make it. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. This one, Susan is asking, have you ever quilted with velour? Mm -mm. No. Velour? Like made a quilt out of velour? Yeah. No, but I want to now. I've made um like some minky quilts and some cuddle quilts, but velour. Could you imagine a velour quilt? And then like you could drape it around your shoulders and go around the house and pretend like you have a cape on and be like, look at me, I run things. And it would be fun. I haven't. No, but I'm all about doing other kinds of medium. I've, I've made a quilt with wall. I made a quilt with rayon. Um, I made a quilt with knit jersey. I'm about to make one with velour. So, um, yeah, like you can make a quilt out of anything at the end of the day. Are you going to snuggle under it? And if you're going to snuggle under on it, it's a success to me. It would be so cozy made up. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I kind of want to make is a velour, like comfy kind of thing, like a sleep dress and just like a wearable blanket. That would be fun. Yeah. That that's your next project, Mr. <laughs> Beth. We'll be that we'll be waiting. Okay. <laughs> tutorial. So, oh, it sounds <laughs> I had not thought of Susan, I have to confess, I hadn't thought of velour for a while. So Neither. I haven't either, but it's like it made me smile. So clearly Why not, right? Yeah. Right. I think I could answer the next next question, but it's for you. And a guest is asking. Does the beginner quilter need, doesn't the beginner quilter need a rotary cutter mat and ruler? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, the nice um, humanoid that was going to the store, you need a cutting mat. You need a rotary cutter. Absolutely. And then of all rulers, I would get like a six inch by 24 inch ruler because that you can cut a lot of the stuff. Maybe one of those and like a smaller one um, that's like a 12 inch one and then you're good. Right on. Who said that? Who is it? Uh, Mr. Domestic, I don't have a name. No it's name person who gives the best advice. Thank you, no name person. I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> now, our next question is from Sharan, and, and she's asking, what are your thoughts on big stitch hand quilting? And she says, I don't know if I could do a bigger project on my home sewing machine. And I think it's gorgeous. I think it's really pretty. Um, like even less, like Sashiko, if you did that, that would be mm. pretty. Um, I love it. It adds, it's hard, to, it's hard to describe the feeling, but it adds whatever this feeling is, this is what it adds. Adds like a mm, to it. Like it just, it makes it feel 
feel more cozy and more, it makes it feel like there's more love. It kind of, not that sewing on my machine, which I love, is like um, sterile because it's not sterile, but it adds like a, a flavor and a level of love and um, care that you don't get in traditionally quilted quilts. So do it, honestly. Yeah, go for it. I, I've never done it, but I know resources to direct, direct you to. Like Susie um, Williams of Susie Quilts does it a lot. I know she's an instructor with Craftsy too. Um, that I would I would check her out, but go for it. Yeah, I want to see that too. That'll be beautiful. And just have a little bit more of that connection as you were talking, Mr. Yeah. Demetri, I I thought of it's kind of the correlation when you knead bread by hand right. and you give a little bit of yourself to the dough. Yep. That's like giving yourself to the quilting. It's just another way to add love. I feel. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Now we have, um, this is from Woodhouse Fan, another question. And this is a great question. Another fabric I haven't thought about for a while, but here <laughs> it goes. Would, will, would wool felt work for batting? She, um, there, um, I have leftovers from various garment projects. Um, wool felt. Yeah. Um. I'm if you, if it's from projects, I'm thinking it's not like the felt squares, right? It's like a wool fabric mm -hmm. you would buy that's thicker. And um, you could, but it has a different breathability factor to it than a batting would. So if you were to use it, I would think it would retain heat a lot more than batting would. So you might sweat more depending on what the environment is like where you live. But um, I'm of the mindset that if it's soft and squishy and less than a quarter inch, you can use it as batting. So um, if it fits into that, go for it. And I want to know what it looks like. I think it will be cool. But um, that's the only thing. It wouldn't breathe. And it might not wash and dry the same. True. Right? I mean, at this yeah. point. It's very possible. Um, and it might shrink, too. Right. Yeah. So pre-wash it, pre-wash it. Next question is about your environment. See your behind you. C Lombard is asking, Mr. D, what is the tote bag behind you? And um, it's giving me an idea to do clamshell EPP. Do it. Absolutely. Let's see that. You know, the class, you know, the class on Craftsy is to teach this is someone named Mr. Domestic. It's one of my classes. I have a um, like an EPP project where I teach this bag. Um, it should be up and I go over how to, I use um, like applique, um, the applique stitch on it and it's really cool. But that's where I got this from. You wanna see it close? It's beautiful. It's really pretty. Thank now you. I have to take that class too. I have like 116 craftsy classes. I'm. I want to take, but that's probably <laughs> everybody that's watching. So, okay, great. Thank you for that. Of course. So our next question is from Cynthia. Cynthia is asking, my mom is wanting a bedspread that's really lightweight. Um, I would love to make her a quilt, but are there any really lightweight fabrics that I could use to make a quilt with? Broadcloth is really too heavy. I don't know, I do know I can use a low loft polyester for the middle, but I'm stuck for the other materials. What do you recommend? Um, in there, did it say the experience of the, the maker? Um, no, Mr. Domestic, I don't have. Right. Okay, so um, if you use the low loft, like they even have like an ultra thin, I, it, it's like there, I, it's, I forgot, but it's like this itty bitty thin that I was going to use to uh, make batted strips for some weaving, but there's, they have something super thin. If you use super thin batting, you don't necessarily need to use super thin fabric as well because it would be light and buoyant. Silk mm -hmm. batting is also lighter than normal batting and it's thinner. And I love how that one quilts as well. But if you're interested in fabric, I said before, like I'd made of wall quilts. I give away a bunch of my st stuff for auctions and stuff, so I don't have a lot of my stuff. But, um, like this is a, 
I've seen quilts made out of this and it's a great summer type of fabric to make a quilt out of. If you use a white batting, then you can't see it, but it's like the drape of it. It's not quilter's cotton. It's more of an apparel fabric, mm. like for scarves and stuff. Oh, look. Like, um, <laughs> like that. But this would, a wall would be a great fabric to try. Um, that if you need me to make a tutorial, I'll make one because that will get me to make this. So, hey, I'll put that on my list of things to do. I'll help you out. But I would check out this one because if you use white batting, then it's um it's perfect it's perfect because it all it'll set the colors that are on the fabric <laughs> make, make sense that helps Yay. <laughs> all right i terry terry mentions and actually i can piggyback onto this too she um she says my grandma made every grand kid a quilt out of corduroy mm. and they were just patchwork but great to snuggle and my piggyback is my first husband's grandmother made a corduroy quilt king size out of old bolsters that were being not being she repurposed old corduroy bolsters and i really i lost that quilt in that in mm. the divorce and so Mr. Domestic, corduroy is fabulous to quilt and with. Do, do you make it like a, a rag quilt with no batting or does it have batting in it or? I, I think what just, I mean, I, 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 I would have to know from Terry, but it sounds like her grandmother made traditional quilts out of corduroy, just like my first husband's quilt. And it was so toasty, like amazing. Amazing. That sounds awesome. That sounds like a snuggle quilt for sure. Yeah. I want to, but y'all put in the comments if y'all know of any other suggestions or made something, put it in the comments because I want to steal your ideas and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Caring is caring. We are, um, then Joanne is asking, uh, I was wondering, she says, I was wondering if you think that wool pressing mats are worth it. Great question. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, that because like for my space and like, I hate to say that, but I even had like a Laura star ironing system. Fabulous. But I didn't have the space for it in here. Um, like it looks bigger, but this right here, it's like, I can almost touch the two walls and like, that's like feet. It's a small, so I don't have the space for it. And what I love about them is I have two that I stack on top of each other. Then I can put that anywhere. And if I'm not using steam, the heat won't get down to whatever surface it's on. So it's going to be fine. And it's going to be durable. So I love it for that. And I found that like when I'm doing foundation paper piecing or smaller piecing, it makes the seams flatter or the outside flatter because the seams go down into the wool a little bit. It's different than on an ironing board. Like when you're on an ironing board and I like to iron instead of press. I can't help it. I just have, I got to be me. Don't judge me. But I do that. And when you do that, it creates like a divot where like the flat fabric goes and then there's like there's like a step up where the seam is if you've done this you know but with wool pressing mats it doesn't do that the fabric is all flush and then the seams go underneath so it's how it's supposed to be so i love them people talk about the smell it's wool like right? right. i'm cool with that that's a natural smell i don't know what the smell on some of these products i have in my room comes from but that one I know it comes from an alpaca or it comes from a sheep and I'm okay with that smell in my room. So um, yeah, I love them. They're affordable. Why not? They're, they're portable. You can take them around. Sounds good. Yeah. Totally natural. We are almost out of time. We're going to take <laughs> one more question. I know this has been so much fun. Okay. Our last, oh, last question. Um, well, actually not a question. Actually, we're basically wrapping up. Any final comment, Mr. Domestic? Um, yeah. I mean, right now, no matter who you are, where you live, what's going on, it's 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 rough. It's rough. When you look at the news, whatever, it's hard to look at. And one thing we can control is creating beautiful things. Um, and anything that we make, regardless of your skill level, it's beautiful because you made it right? It didn't exist before you made it. That this has become my retreat, my personal retreat, whether it's the corner of a room 
or somewhere in your house or hiding out in the closet with some needle and thread, like find it. Um, I, I don't want to sound cheesy, but I'm that passionate about like crafting and sewing and quilting. I feel like it kind of saved my life and gave me a direction and passion that I didn't know existed. And so I know the power of it. So I would, I just encourage everyone, whoever's watching this, um, pick up something and make something if you've never made it before. Um, it'll be, it'll bring joy, even a little bit of incremental joy added to a day in my book is worth it. Cause I'm taking joy wherever I can get it nowadays. And this is one place where I know that I can. So I empower all of you to do the same. Mr. Domestic, thank you so much for being our first guest on Craftsy Chat. You have made Craftsy Chats. You have made our afternoon beautiful and joyful. I hope all of you are inspired because I am. And please just keep going. and. Yeah. Let us know what you're up to. Bye, we'll be watching. Bye, everyone. See you next month.